<laughs> Welcome, everybody. <laughs> We've waited a long time for this particular Lathan to happen. Um, and I will be introducing our main speakers in a little bit. But first, to help us put names to faces, and you guys have been working on that over, over dinner, and it's been fun watching people connect and discover and people that they have in common. But I'm going to ask each of you to introduce yourselves to kick us off for the evening. And I'm going to ask you to do it. You know, obviously, this always needs to be relatively quick, but also with a bit of something that helps people go, oh, yeah, he or she is the person from. And so that's what I'm going to ask each of you to do, is to say where you currently live and the place that you most consider home, which may or may not be the same place. Now, that this sometimes stresses people out. <laughs> I mean, that's where why I say the place that you can sit, most consider home, you're allowed to say one or two places. You know, that's okay. You don't need to unpack that for us now, why you can't choose between the places. That's something that we get to chase up later. So feel free to say, you know, these two places are actually home for me. Um, and all the other sort of things that you would expect people to introduce themselves, maybe what they do, or who else is in the family, or even why they're here. I'm going to encourage you guys to ask those questions of each other throughout the weekend. So that is your job, to get to know each other while you're here. Every single person that is here is fascinating and beautiful. And there are, yeah, you are an incredible group of people. And so I encourage you to take the time to get to know each other while you are here. Um, and I want to just do a little bit of a more, so thank you everybody for that. And you know, as always, there will be no quiz on that. But hopefully I'll come back to you in conversations. There'll be a little bits and pieces. I saw a few people go, oh, she lives near me. Oh, you know, that person lives near, near me. So that, that's very fun. So do follow up on those. Um, but one introduction that's going to be a little more extended than either Dad or Michal is our Kathy Nichols skull. Um, so they always have to put up with this little bit of embarrassment. <laughs> but um, every year for Lynn Laffin, we have a scholarship that funds a theology student or a student interested in theology who is either from or studying in Ontario. And I look back to my notes here to make sure that I don't miss anything here, but yeah, this, this scholarship is named Kathy Nichols Scholarship because it seeks to honor a woman who, her, Kathy was alive from 1910 to 2004, and it seeks to honor Kathy and her significant educational legacy of practiced theology, hospitable humility, and integrated community. Um, for those of you familiar with InterVarsity, and if you read the books, you might be told that InterVarsity was founded by a man named Howard Guinness. Really, so he came over to England, was sent, to Eng or sent from England to Canada to be a missionary to students, found this woman to be his secretary. Mm -hmm. He only stuck around here for a couple of years before he went off to Australia. And it was Kathy Nichol who kept InterVarsity going and sent off a missionary named Stacey Woods to start InterVarsity in the States. Mm -hmm. And it became a global movement. And it's because of Kathy's passion for nature and creation that InterVarsity in Canada actually has pioneer camps which is unique in, in InterVarsity in the world. Canada has these pioneer camps that really sort of reflect a part of the Canadian identity. And also started ISCF, which is the high school version of InterVarsity. And we have more than one InterVarsity connected pe persons, people in this room. Um, is, who else besides Ruth and I have actually worked for InterVarsity? In this room? So just the two of us have worked. I know several other people have been involved with InterVarsity in different capacities. Um, but, yeah, I, I won't say more about Kathy right now. Um, I should say, you know, Dad, you, know, you knew Kathy. Uh, did anyone else here know Kathy Nichol personally? No. Um, Kathy went, was granted the Governor General's Award of Canada for her work with Canadian youth. Um, and, yeah, it was, um, I guess that the other thing I wanted to say about Kathy is that when she agreed to be Guinness's secretary, she had just started university herself, and so she set her studies aside, yeah. and she never completed her paper degree so that she could work with 
university students across the country and help them figure out how to integrate their faith with their intellect. Mm -hmm. And she's a pretty special person. And so the recipient of this scholarship is, um, in a way that would delight Kathy herself, is, it, is expected to assist generally throughout the conference. So not only to be the primary TA for the speakers, but from Wednesday through the Sunday evening or Monday, to be an extra set of hands generally. So facilitating conversation with the team and with you guys, to setting up chairs, to helping serve meals and doing dishes, even cleaning your toilets, <laughs> alongside other academics who do the same. And this, I think, is so true to the model and calling of Kathy. What does it mean to be a Christian academic? Mm -hmm. And so it is a delight to have Julia here in that role. We have several other former Kathy Nichols scholars on the team. And Julia was first recommended to us five years ago by her professors mm -hmm. who were attending this conference to be a Kathy Nichols scholar. She was accepted as a Kathy Nichols scholar in 2020. In, 20, in 2020 yeah. is when you got your acceptance. So she's yeah. waited a long time. <laughs> <because of the pandemic. laughs> For those of you who saw the Zoom last year, she helped set up the Zoom, but she's the longest standing cat. <laughs> <laughs> it is yes, wonderful to have Julia up here. <laughs> as part of that scholarship, it is mandatory that Julia is in on as many of the sessions as she can, so she can't miss any of the discussion time, but when we aren't having discussions, she'll be out running about with the team. Now, as you will read in your packet, the concept of hospitality is an integral aspect to both the legacy and the heart of Lynn Lavin. Hospitality, the love of strangers, does not just mean opening one's home, but it means being loving, being welcoming in presence, de demeanor, being attentive to the other. And it's something that we do both as host, but also as guest. And that's what Christ calls us to do. So it's not just the team that are here to are called to be hospitable in this place, but it's the rest of you who are also called to be hospitable. Those of us gathered in this room tonight come from many different backgrounds, culturally, theologically, politically, socially, even artistically. And it's our desire that this weekend is one of deep dialogue and engagement, but one that is so overridden by the honoring of practiced love that your neighbor feels safe to express a different opinion. That your own words make space for others to be listened to and heard. Some of that simply remembering that this is like singing in a choir. The voice that one uses as a soloist is very different from that used when one is meant to be part of the whole. Some of that remembrance is choosing not to be easily offended. Choosing to take time to ponder before responding cultivating an attitude of grace towards each other. Some of that is making space for the questions of others, not just your own, or an attitude, well, I would say, or indeed um, asking questions. For some of us, that's our act of hospitality, is having the courage to ask your own questions and not just wait for others to do so. So I invite you to join us, the team, in choosing a hospitable attitude, not just to those from, say, another country, like Romania or the States, but to each person with whom we're engaging throughout our time together, including our speakers. So simple things like arriving in time to be seated as the session begins. So being here before that 0 .00 or 0 .05 on the clock, that means that you will not distract the others, that you will not miss work that others have been preparing for you. Even not chatting whilst others are speaking is an act of hospitality. There are always exceptions that will sometimes make these things impossible. Indeed, the team themselves are going to be slipping in and out of these sessions because they are preparing our food, our drinks, etc. The reason that they're slipping in is because whilst they are serving us and facilitating our own enjoyment and focus, they are still a part of us. We try to design the schedule so that they can take in as much of the conference as possible in part as a thanks to the absolutely crazy amount of work they have done to make this event happen as volunteers. 
So before we even begin, team, thank you so much. Yes. The oldies and the newbies. <laughs> Even know a few days ago that you're going to be talking about <laughs> packet. We're going to do a quick walk through the welcome packet, and then Lindsay's going to give you some housekeeping info, and then we're going to settle down into getting to better know these two teachers and poets who dared to join us on this little map in the weekend. Okay, now we get down to the fun stuff. These two at my mercy. <laughs> Rather than recite a biography that you guys could all read online or read in the book somewhere, or give you a list of well deserved accolades of these two gentlemen, I'm going to introduce them by an evening of questions. They've kind of put up with something like this from me before and survived it. So this will be new questions if those of, for those of you who have seen that session online um, and see where that takes us in the time we have left to us tonight. Um, and the hope being that this will be a foundation, perhaps in unexpected ways, for the rest of the evening, or the rest of the weekend, together. You know, Dad and Michal, often we hear of your accomplishments, etc., when you're speaking at places, um, but often as if your life only mattered once you started publishing and lecturing. And that's true of so many speakers, right, when we go to conferences, is as if that's all that matters about who, who, the, who they are. Um, and so I'm going to ask you both to tell us a little bit about your roots. And maybe let's just start with that as a question. Could you each tell us a little bit about your roots and one or two delights from your childhood or youth that shaped who you are today? Now the unfair thing is they have not heard these questions yet, so they may need to take time to ponder that or you know, decide who gets to go first on that question. And you don't have to be particularly profound or deep, but you, know, you can't be, but no pressure. But if you could tell us a little bit about your roots. Shallow roots are fine. Yeah, shallow yeah. roots are fine. We'll, we'll let you know whether you were profound or not. <laughs> <laughs> One or two delights from your childhood and youth that, that you would say shaped who you are today. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll start then. Um, you know, uh, my roots are here in, in Lanark County, really, although I was born closer to uh, and raised closer to Ottawa. For the first 13 years of my life, I went to, uh, with my family, to um, what is now Westboro, really, that, that part of Ottawa, uh, Scottish Baptist Church. And, and I would say that that uh, first 13 years of my life, up uh, to the time of my baptism, and 12 in the year following, really shaped me in fundamental ways. But one of the delights that came uh, with that uh, was uh, I was a difficult child, I guess, you know, is the way you'd say it politely today. And it got me into a school um, that I had to go a long way to on a bus. Uh, it was either that or a place that's down in Alfred, Ontario. I know those of you are from Ontario would know that's a reform school. So uh, this school was a lifesaver for me. It was a turnaround thing. I encountered a man named Pop Shaver, who was, uh, was and remains to this day the greatest teacher I have ever known. I was in grade eight um, when he, <laughs> he taught us. And uh, we were a bunch of thugs, 36 boys in one room. They wouldn't let us be anywhere near girls <laughs> for good and proper reasons. We were just nuisance, you know. Um, but, you know, we were hockey champs of, of, of the city schools and, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, uh, but um, he made us learn, and we didn't know how much he made us learn. It was just that it was terrifying. 
<laughs> uh, you know, so he taught us uh, uh, calculus, for example. Uh, how, uh, for those of you who uh, know something about the school system in Ontario, know, know that no grade eight students get calculus now. But we took the calculus exam, and then the grade thirteen students at Lisgar Collegiate in Ottawa took the same exam, and we whipped them. <laughs> we whipped them. He was a teacher, and uh, but what <laughs> what really shaped me, and it's a delight to this day for me. So when I'm thinking back, he made us memorize 2,000 lines of British poetry. In addition to that, passages of scripture, and I mean long passages of scripture, uh, the various psalms, Ecclesiastes 12, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. When the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, and thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Well, now I'm at that age. <laughs> and I appreciate what he was doing. He was laying in things that I think have found profoundly affected all of us. And uh, when I think back on gifts, you know, gifts that the, the Lord and his providence allows you to have in life, uh, to, to me, this is one of the greatest gifts of all. And... Um, I won't tell you any more about him now, but I'll, I'll let you know this, that we had to memorize 240 lines from Child Harold's Pilgrimage by Byron. <laughs> and, uh, <coughs> it, 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 you know, that's not the most you know, amiable poem you would think, right? But it was so profoundly and wisely taught. It was about the beginning of the Battle of Waterloo. And we all, there was an audible groan when he assigned that. Every Friday you had to recite, but it was only six of the 36 boys recited picked at random, and the issue wasn't whether you had it memorized. I mean, God help you if you hadn't it memorized, you know. The issue was whether you could show by your recitation that you understood the poem. And uh, when, <laughs> there were mostly things, sonnets, like, you know, Keats or something, you know, Shelley. Uh, but, but 200 lines, so, uh, 240 lines, so there was a groan in the class. He didn't say a thing. He just walked over to the window. He laid his hand on the sill. It was pouring rain outside in November. And he recited the whole thing. And when he was done, there wasn't a dry eye in the class. Because it begins with a, with a party and a dance, you know. Uh, and there was a sound of revelry by Nathan. Belgium's capital had gathered dead her beauty and her chivalry. And bright, the lamp shot over fair women and brave men. A thousand hearts beat happy. And then you hear the sounds of the cannon. And uh, one man knows what it is. Everybody else keeps dancing. But then finally the word comes to the people and they part. You know, there's alarm, you know. Then there were parties such as press the light from the young hearts, you know. Um, but it ends uh, that with, the, with this passage where the soldiers are going off to war in Ardennes forest. And it says, um, and Ardennes waves above them her green leaves. Grieving. If our inanimate air grieves, or the unreturning brave, your need need to be trodden like this grass, which now we need from but above shall grow in this next verdure. Mm -hmm. And this fiery mass of living valor, rolling on the foe and burning with bright hope, shall more hold the hope. Mm -hmm. That's when he stopped, all these thugs. Because <laughs> our dads had fought in the Second World War, and, and some of them didn't come home, you know. So, <laughs> so anyway, um, the next week just happened to be November the 11th, and if you're a Canadian, you know, that's the day you remember uh, the men and the women that fought and served in the war. Now, that's the kind of teaching that will not let you rest. <laughs> so I didn't have a teacher like that in high school, at all, not a one, you know, and I had to wait for years and years before anybody could touch it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that was, I want, that's enough of a delight for me. But you know, you could see how that was a fun, fundamental one for me. But I, I'm not going to be that profound, David. <laughs> 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 uh, so, well, I suppose my background is that I was, um, I was born in a nursing home called the Stella Morris which is where good middle-class Dublin boys were born in those days. Uh, and uh, it came in very useful later because the National Concert Hall is opposite it, and I was commissioned to do uh, poems on the National Concert Hall. 
and which had been the exam hall of, uni of the National University where I had matriculated at 16. Uh, and and um, so it came in very useful when I had to, when I had to do a celebration of, of, of the particular place. Uh, I was, I suppose if I have to think of, of a delight of my early childhood would have been the fact that my father loved music and uh, so, but one of his great loves, believe it or not, was the Doily Cart operas, it was Gilbert and Sullivan. Uh, uh, and um, he, would, he had the texts of the operettas and it was, we sat down on a Sunday afternoon and listened to them. And I, I, remember, I remember that we had what was called in those days a girl. Uh, we weren't allowed to say maid, it was a girl. Uh, and the, uh, there was a hooped up um, loudspeaker in the kitchen for her to hear from the radio which was in the dining room where, where my parents listened to the news and the stock exchange at lunchtime uh, uh, and um, I remember standing out in the kitchen and hearing some of the music from the Mikado and thinking if there's a heaven this it's going to be like this it was, uh, uh, and, and uh, so I, I loved him I remember my, you know from early birthdays I got presents of the young, of long players of the young and of the guard and uh, and Iolanthe and so on and, and uh, it was all part of that era because schools in those days were doing Gilbert and Sullivan's but but Sullivan God love him uh, was underrated I think as a musician you know then they fought they fought the whole time Gilbert and Sullivan they never stopped fighting uh, he was a crusty old lawyer who, who did these these uh, these lyrics but the music I think is, is lovely I mean I think I think Sullivan is awful underrated and he kind of felt sad all his life because he wasn't taken seriously as a classical composer so uh, one of my great memories is that thinking that if there's a heaven this is go it's going to sound like this mm -hmm. uh, um, so is he in five quintets uh, well, no, no. This was uh, this Gilbert and Sullivan. Yeah, well, no, but it's just music, you know, which I, which uh, which I've loved all my life. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, and the the, uh, and I think another happy memory from those uh, or d delight from those days is that um, I I started to love poetry in the primary school, uh, and I I remember very very clearly there was. Um, He's since dead, and I've been thinking a lot about him recently. I looked him up in later life. I hadn't known him. He was a priest. He was a, a, an apprentice priest, so to speak, when, when, when I had him in class. Uh, and um, uh, uh, he was teaching English. Uh, but the, the, uh, I remember that he, um, we were learning, I remember, I remember the house where I was born. Do you know, everybody, you know that one, Hood, I think it is, isn't it? Uh, the, the sun came peeping in at morn, it never came a wink too soon or stayed and not too long and so on. But I remember that we were learning it and for some reason or other I got into trouble and we got, he, he and it wasn't any perversion despite what has happened to a Catholic priest afterwards, but he, you were punished by slapping your thighs. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and he slapped my thighs and when I was going down again out of mischief, I waved at him back up, got hit again, went down, did the same again. And this went on until I was reduced to tears and I went back, but there was a wonderful second verse about, and now, you know, about, about tears in, 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 in the thing. And suddenly that was, I think that was for me when poetry suddenly meant everything to me. Uh, um, and then I, I, you know, I knew poems in Irish uh, from an early age as well. And I, mem I remember learning them off. I, had, I was afraid of the dark as a boy. And so um, it was put back to the fact that we, one, of the, I, the first, one of the girls I had when I was born first, my mother always said that I was closer to her than even to, to my mother. Mm -hmm. But she, was, she went to marry uh, and her sister came instead. And her sister was of a different temperament and told me if I got up at night, I'd be bitten out of the bed. So I, obviously, I don't remember that, but my mother told me that, and therefore I had to have light always. And I remember learning poems by heart with the light, the little coloured light which I had during the night. Er ymwalysio chanig mwynt yn tîn, y donach o bôn as eich o ghyr, y cap i'n bôn yn oed a chata, as rôp i'n chroed yn oed a charawata. And I, learned, I remember learning that with great, great joy. Uh, um, uh, uh, so, but, but I left home, uh, I left home at probably at 12. I don't think I ever went back, really. I went to boarding school. Um, and the other thing is that I begged to go to boarding school. My parents had no intention of sending me. I had a pal who was going off to boarding school, and I sort of, 
uh, you know, I was I had read these books, um, Billy Bunter and so on about you yeah. know about boarding school and cads being sent to uh, to Coventry and all sorts mm-hmm. of carry on. There was some sort of mystery about it, and I had a cousin I saw playing on a rugby team who was at a boarding school, and all sort of and somehow <laughs> that I I I, 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 I saw. And my friend was a charmer, and he charmed my mother always. Uh, he was, uh, uh, and so my father thought about it. It was a Jesuit boarding school, it's Clongos, in fact, where Joyce, Joyce describes in the portrait of an artist. And uh, uh, my father didn't approve, didn't want this at all. He'd been with the Holy Ghost Fathers in Black Rock, and he said, I don't like the damn Jesuits. You, you either turn out excellent or you go to the dogs, he said. Uh, uh, so he didn't, li- he didn't like the idea at all, but... but, but uh, my, I was my mother's, the apple of my mother's eye, and I got my way, and I was sent off to Boris. I never came home again, really, I think. Mm. Uh, um, you know, you got visits every fortnight, and uh, I remember sit, you sat in the car outside on the courtyard, and I can still see my, see my, being my parents looking at me in the rear mirror. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, uh, and uh, but the world changed. You see, all, all the things in boarding school, whether you were picked for the team, whether you were going to be the captain of the team, whether you were going to be in trouble in class or anything, you shared that with your friends. Mm-hmm. And uh, the people on the street where you grew up and your family and everything, that news began to sort of just fade for me. It, it had no, lost its meaning really. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and But what I'm so delighted for is that all my life, Friendship has been one of the most important things to me, yes. and I think that goes back to boarding school. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I loved my friends, and you know, and I still even even at dinner parties afterwards in later life with my late first wife, where we had dinner parties and lots of people uh, 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 always at weekends with the party. I always remember that members in school there was a scramble for, 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 for after the first the first mass or the first morning of the year there was you had to rush the, to the ref, to refectory and there was a scramble for, for tables for places but I remember being getting ahead of table getting the head, to the head of table and having my friends around me and for life that became my model of, 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 of real enjoyment was to have have your to have friends around you to share to share food with friends uh, um, so they're, they're, they're sort of very, very important memories for me. Uh, um, the, the, uh, so have I been profound enough? Can I stop or do I go? <laughs> I just want to point out that you end mm. five quintets with exactly that. I do, mm. I do. And I also, I also, I don't know if you noticed last night, rugby was a great passion. Yeah. I, I did captain the junior cup team and I on occasions captain the senior rugby team. I never played after college because, uh, you know, when I, when I was young I played with childish things. But 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 um, uh, I, I loved rugby and it was, uh, I mean, uh, I actually know an Irishman who introduced can- to can- rugby to Canada, which <laughs> may or at least he claimed to, but, but uh, in the States, of course, they're no bloody good at it, you know. So the, 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 uh, uh, the, the Irish are now number one in the world, I'm told. I, I have, I've kind of fallen out. I don't watch it because it's at an odd time in New York, and I've let it go. Uh, uh, but but, but uh, it, was, it was a game, it was a great game for the like of me. I hadn't great ball skills, uh, um, but I was as tough as nails. I was as big now as uh, when I was 14, 13 as I am now, and you didn't get in my way. Uh, uh, and it was, it was a game that you didn't, you know, if you were a bat, yes, you had to pass and kick. But there was a place for people who had, who could beat the sugar out of anyone and got in their way, basically. <laughs> uh, it was called a scrum, and it was called a thing. So, and I really enjoyed that. I don't know if you noticed in the five contests, one of my great memories was the interception. I saw that. Yeah, mm-hmm. Because, uh, you know, that, that was the great moment of glory, you know, when, when, because if you played, particularly if you played a wing forward, which I think is called a flanker now at the back, of the show. And, and rugby has changed. The forwards are much faster, much more skillful now than they used to be. But you're, you, the, the, as, as if it went on the other side, the ball went out, they passed it out, and you watched. And if you could run and intercept the ball between two backs and score, that was heaven. <laughs> Absolute heaven, you know. So that's what I was, uh, I was yeah. referring to there. Uh, and so, yes, uh, uh, and my friends are on the table. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, that, that is certainly my, 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 my idea of heaven. But music also. I just, I, I love music. And I should, so when my father brought me to, um, there, there was no national concert hall, which as I mentioned earlier, the, the exam hall in UCD became and was converted to, but there was no, in the old days there was none. 
uh, but there was one Irish pianist who was well known by the name of Charles Lynch and he'd made his way in London and was very well known in, in, in England but my father brought he played in the boxing stadium of all things the National Boxing Stadium it was perfect because he was in the centre and uh, and uh, uh, I just I just I just thought it was sheer sheer magic and uh, I, I started piano lessons when I was nine and ten and went to uh, one Miss Muriel Morris who looked after her elderly parents and smoked the whole time. Uh, 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 but, 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 uh, and I, I talked to an old school friend of mine from childhood and he thought, thought she was awful. I thought she was marvellous. I learned, I learned so much from her in just two years. Uh, and I, I know that at that age I either tried to make, to, to, to make poems if I had, if I was upset about something, or I went to the piano, one of the two. Mm. Uh, 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 and and uh, but when I went to boarding school, piano faded completely uh, because you had to give all your free time to it uh, uh, if you were going to do it. Because there was, there was no time for practice except during recreational time. And if you were an all-rounder, as I was, I was involved in drama, I was involved in debating, I was involved in everything. We just couldn't. You just couldn't. you had to either devote yourself to it and didn't, and I didn't. But but. Um, I, I am now 75, and six months ago I took up, or uh, maybe more, maybe it's nine months now, I took up the piano again with a Serbian professional pianist, and I'm enjoying it immensely. Uh, 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 so it's maybe, maybe all these things go in some sort of circle, you know, but, but, but uh, 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 my ambition is, is to play a few pieces still, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and she's a wonderful teacher because uh, she's the most highly qualified, she, you know, she was fourth in the Rome piano competition uh, and, uh, and and she's much much greater pianist than anybody taught me before and the extraordinary thing is she 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 is the most encouraging mm-hmm. you know she says if you have the will and you do the practice and I'll support you you can play anything mm-hmm. and my gosh I'm going to <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, um, so they're my delights from childhood I think uh, um, and, and they persist as you noticed as my as my idea of heaven so I, enough profundity. Over to you, David. <laughs> <laughs> for more profundity. Well, could I? Is it fair for me to say, will you allow me yeah. to call you a Dubliner, and you an Ottawa Valley boy? Sure. Yeah, I suppose I suppose it is. But there's another side to me which maybe I didn't mention. Mm-hmm. As I, I and uh, my. <laughs> There was a columnist on the on a newspaper in Ireland who was always referred to his current wife. Uh, uh, but, but I, my my current wife, my second my second wife, my beloved Christina. Uh, um, in, in, in the 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 um, she she uh, is shocked always when she hears that I at the age of twelve went off on my own to the Aran Islands, uh, uh, and uh, from then on. It changed my life. Uh, uh, I, I've spoken Irish since I was 12, so nobody actually would know I wasn't from there when I speak it. Uh, and I've written the standard work used across the world for learning the language. So that was a huge delight of my childhood, too. And uh, it, my first wife was from a, an Irish speaking area and was for 44 years it was Irish. We spoke always together. It wouldn't have been natural for us to speak anything else. So, so that is another delight, I think, of my childhood, which is a very form- formative one for me because I was to my first degree was in Celtic languages. I, I, I was a lecturer in, in in Trinity College Dublin in Irish at the age of 22, uh, uh, and, and old Irish and <laughs> Celtic philology generally. So, so that was a very also a very formative uh, formative um, thing for me. Anyway, that, that that's enough for me. So would you identify more as a Dubliner or what would you say call someone from Erin? Uh, well, from the West. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's uh, I've always had this uh, this stubbornness in me. Right. Uh, that that uh, you know, and I mean, my f- my beloved Breed said to me, you know, that she fell in love with me because I understood her world, because right. I was from that world, right. and a part of me was from yes. that world. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I, I I'm both. Okay. I'm both. I think you know. Because uh, uh, part of what I wanted to push yeah. into was what does it mean to be, and I think you've given a little piece of that. What does it mean to be a Dublin, or what does it mean to be someone from a yeah, well, I mean, I never, I, I never would claim to be from it, but I would always say that it's deeply, it's, it's, it's mm-hmm. yeah, it's, 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 and I would always say Irish is the language of my heart. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, I, I, I'm not saying it was only Irish, but uh, 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 because it was another very formative influence in my life. I was at university in Norway, of course, mm-hmm. and, and Norway is my second. Even after eight years in, in New York, I'd still say Norway is my second homeland. 
uh, uh, so but 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 uh, 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 I, I still I still consciously and this is uh, this is probably an odd thing I, I, and I'm going to divert for a second my best Icelandic friend whom I who whom I after well I had a slight affair with an Icelandic girl but then I, afterwards it was this friend of mine who at least I always spoke Icelandic to any before we was face time I used to come every year to make sure I didn't forget my Icelandic come to Ireland and so on uh, and um, a wonderful guy, but I remember talking to him. He, when, he, yeah, when he, the crash came in 2008, he went to Norway because he could earn twice as much there. He was a very well-known psychiatrist, uh, um, and I remember us both thinking, both talking at the time, how it would be to be that there was something sad about being uh, living in exile. Mm -hmm. But we both ended up doing it actually, which is very so. He 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 ended up uh, uh, so so that uh, you know. Even though I'm in New York and love New York, and uh, because you asked the question, where is home? Home for me, and I echo Lindsay in this, home is where I love and I'm loved. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so home is New York now. But, mm -hmm. but, 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 but um, it would be another very profound, no, it's a very profound influence on me. So I even wrote poetry in, in Norwegian when I was a student because there were beautiful women I wanted to write poetry for. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, so, so I, I did my best. I even broadcast some of them, believe it or not. Uh, that was because I'd had an affair with a lady who had a program on the radio, but that's uh, <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Well, I suppose what it means is that there are certain, and there's a similarity here to me how, um, people. Uh, you know, I still if you, uh, met one of your neighbors the other night, you know, and I immediately felt completely at home with Karen, right? Mm -hmm. Because uh, this is the kind of person I've known all my life. And um, my students sometimes uh, you know, pointed out to me that there's a part of me that's more an Ottawa Valley farmer than a PhD in, in, in comparative literature, you know? Uh, and, and I, have, I have no embarrassment about that at all, you know, and uh, it's because, in a sense, um, I'm rooted in, in, in the community of people, I'm rooted in the land. When I was a, a boy, I loved nothing better than to get on one of the horses and ride out mm -hmm. by myself, you know, way out, something out beyond the ranch, way out toward uh, Pat walk and flower station and, uh, you know, get on a height of land where I could see lakes and things like that. And, and um, so there's a, there's a, I suppose this is the uh, kind of introverted thing and everything, but, you know, um, there was a tremendous uh, communion with the Lord and with his creation that was a part of the rhythm of my childhood here. And... Uh, you know, it's a, I've, I've been delighted with being in lots of other places in the world. I mean, you know, uh, you know from talking to me that, you know, my, my time in Italy was transformative in its own way. You know, I love those people. And I uh, got on like a house of fire with, with, with people on Italian culture, magnificent food, magnificent talk about feast, you know. You know, sit down with a meal, you know, with a bunch of people that just love food and it takes five courses and you start it. 9 o'clock at night and you don't finish eating till 11 and then they bring out the digestifs, you know, and uh, and you carry on till 2 or 3 in the morning and, and it's just a piece of friendship, you know, at which the food is an augmentation. Now, I, I love that too, but what, what is true is that uh, there's, a, there's a spiritual home that I would ha have to admit I have, and, and it's here. A, a friend of mine at the end of me used to always say, have you any suggested big biscuits? <laughs> <laughs> Dad referenced horses there, um, and those of you who have been here on the team helping out have seen Mio's incredible affinity for the cats who have fallen in love with him and his Gaelic. Um, you both clearly love animals but you both have very different experiences with them. Mm. Could you talk a little about Michal and animals? David and you animals. Love. Okay, you got me this time. <laughs> uh, um, no, the, the, well, I, mean, I was talking about cats, basically. Uh, um, my mother had at least three cats in the bed, always. Uh, and uh, 
I, I, so though I have sad memories of it because the, the it, it was something you went down the country for a holiday with your parents and they somehow or other they came back with a cat you know <laughs> uh, 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 and I, uh, um, but I, I was allowed to own one of the cats um, Billy and I I, I, I was <laughs> and, and, uh, good to know yeah. <laughs> 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 well, the next time I'm cheated <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the the, the uh, uh, but the sad thing for me was uh, I, the first time I experienced death was Billy actually, mm-hmm. and it was it was mm-hmm. awful. I remember it so so well because they they tried to revive him, giving him whiskey, oh, <laughs> uh, um, yeah. uh, and uh, I remember seeing through my tears and mm-hmm. the whole thing was he breathing and was he not breathing, mm-hmm. and through my tears I kept imagining that he was mm-hmm. he was breathing, you know, uh, uh, and he was, and then he had to be buried in the garden. So that was the first time I met death really, mm-hmm. uh, and. Uh, um, it made a, a very big impression on me. So I, 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 I love cats, but, but I, I, I love animals generally. You know, I mean, I, I, I love dogs as well. I mean, if I was walking in Norway on my own and there was horses, I'd spend ages bringing them across with, you know, to, to feed them with a bit of grass or anything. Mm-hmm. I, I love animals. I, you know, uh, um, and as you noticed, I always speak Irish to them. Yeah, it's wonderful. Yes, uh, uh, the, the, um, uh, because, because, I mean, I... I I actually started out thinking about my Icelandic friend. He said to me in exile in Norway that he always, when he was on his own, because he was talking Norwegian the whole time to his patients and everybody else, when he was on his own, he always said, I think in Icelandic, because I don't want to go back to Iceland for one of these people mixed up and not able to, you know, sort of put them in Norwegian words instead of Icelandic words. I deliberately in New York, when I'm on my own, switch over to thinking in Irish, because uh, that's who I am. Uh, 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 so anyway, that's that, that that's that's not about, about, about it. so so I, I take the opportunity of talking Irish to animals always, and they always respond beautifully. Mm-hmm. <laughs> have, have you published in Irish? Irish oh yes, I, my first three books were in Irish. Mm. Mm-hmm. I translated them subsequently. It was a terribly hard decision for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, I had to decide between whatever whatever talent I had been given uh, uh, and my deep deep love. Uh, of, uh, of Irish uh, and I'm afraid I made what I consider at the time a moral decision which was that I, you know, if I had been whatever talent I had I wanted uh, like the parable to bring it back uh, uh, um, uh, not, to, not to bury it and the truth, the truth is that uh, I got, it, it, was, it was sad you know, you, you'd, you'd, um, you'd have readings and people come up to you afterwards and because the Irish I had was extremely rich and if people come up to you afterwards and say, uh, uh, um, "Oh God, it was so lovely to hear the Irish. It was so beautiful. I didn't understand a word of it. But it was beautiful yeah. to hear." Anything. I, I couldn't take that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah, uh, uh, and afterward, and the other thing was like it, it, being a pers- being a, a protected species. Uh, uh, you, you know, in other words, that you know, if the government were going to send somebody out somewhere, well, they'd send. They have to send one of the protected species. You know. I didn't want that. I was a poet, and and what I was writing was meant thing to me. So I made what I, what was for me a moral decision, uh, and all my work since I didn't I didn't make a song and dance about it at the time because uh, there was no it just would distract from my thing. And so when asked in interviews, I remember when uh, uh, I just said, "Well, it's music," and I played in the harpsichord and I played in the I played on the piano now, uh, 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 and uh, so you know. 16, 18 books later, but I also, for my collective, did translate the original ones, and they're quoted all around. People, people have forgotten they were written originally in Irish. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, so, so uh, it was it, it was a heartbreaking decision, uh, uh, and uh, but but uh, I I made it, and I don't. I'm very happy I did. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it, it just it, it began to be a bit like talking to yourself, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and even those who would buy books in Irish, they didn't have the vocabulary, they didn't have the, the thing written, and the vocabulary was shrinking. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, that uh, it was heartbreaking to go to where my wife was from, and we were beginning to words were you know half sentences in English and half sentences in Irish. It was just heartbreaking. But mm-hmm. but but uh, any, anyway, so that's the answer to your question, mm-hmm. a long one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Can you move back to animals? Uh, yeah, back to animals. Mm-hmm. Well, animals are very important to me. Ever, my, my my kid brother, who was four years old when he was hit by a truck and I was six, left a big hole in my life. Um, and uh, my parents weren't able to handle his death, 
well at all. So they were, they were basically scrambled themselves as a result of this, and my mother in particular was, was we would say today, psychotic. So I was kind of a lonely child, and uh, one of the things that was wisely permitted to me was to have a dog, mm -hmm. and that dog became a dear friend. <laughs> so, uh, so that also played a, an important role, and, 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 and in the sense that I do feel that uh, animals commune with you if you're willing to commune with them. And I think all my children have experienced the same thing. I've had very close relationships with horses in my case, where, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I haven't heard of the horse whisperer thing, but I mean, I could basically yes. talk to them and they would understand. And, and um, you know, uh, horses get to be, I think next to dogs, they're the ones that like most to commune. You know, mm -hmm. the, to, to, to have a relationship with you. Um, and I give uh, the cats a go to. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd be the wrong man to ask about that. I have no empirical I for, it, for it. Yeah. But, um, so I, I, I had that. But I also had, through my life, experiences in which I think I was spoken to, really, by the Lord through animals. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll just give you two examples, maybe, or, or three. Um, two, I think, will do. Um, one time in my life when I was in profound quandary as to, uh, as to really what to do with myself. Um, I had been two years at university and my dad called me home because he wanted me to help run uh, the, one of the family businesses for, uh, while he attended to the other. And um, I was too young for that, but I, I did it. And I, I didn't enjoy it. I, it, put it gently, I was torn between a sense of duty and a sense of desire to be and I went up with my bicycle into a part of the forest down along the Ottawa River near where we lived. And I just stopped at a clearing and I was thinking and wondering about this and so on. And all of a sudden up to the handlebars of my bicycle swept a little screech owl and he perched on the handlebars. And he just looked at me. <laughs> and I just looked at him. You know? <laughs> and after a while, he flew off. Um, and, uh, you know, when I got to back to university and started studying literature, I thought, well, I understand these Greek bird omens now. I mean, I, I, you know. <laughs> uh, but I've had other ones. I've, I've had other, another one at a precious point in my life much later. And I was uh, out on the side of, uh, of Mount St. Patrick. And, uh, sitting on a stone fence and uh, all by myself everybody else had gone off to, to church in Renfrew and um, I was reading um, the Psalms and, and I read in particular that day Psalm 90 uh, the, the Psalm of Moses uh, and Psalm 91 which uh, you know in, in medieval times um, this would be true in this far back as the Irish poets. They called this a lorica, uh, a breastplate, a protector. Lurich is the word, actually. Yeah, that's the Irish word, yeah. It, it gets used in, in, in Latin Lurich. as lorica yeah. uh, brought over. But um, anyway, so I was reading those from, uh, uh, I don't know if you know what the uh, shantymen were. The, this is a group that used to, to minister to lumberjacks and miners in the far north. And they produced a Bible and a Psalter um, well, a full Bible, and then like a little hymn book and Psalter, both of them about that big. I mean, I, could, I, I couldn't read the titles now, but I have them still. Uh, and and the, they were covered in a kind of a little moleskin. And that's it's, it's the only rational way I can explain what happened. So I was reading this, and I had just finished the 91st Psalm, deeply moved by it. And I closed the text, and it was a of a, a bird wings off the top of my head. And I looked up, flying straight up from my head, was a sparrow hawk. Whoa. And he just hovered there for a moment and flew off. And I said, Lord, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> I can't handle this. <laughs> but I realized that, um, you know, there was there, there's a kind of communion you can have in with the whole of the Lord's creation. And I think, for some of us at least, we experience that not just through standing on the side of a mountain and looking at the glorious view, but by taking in the animate in it, you know, and, and, uh, and you know, breathing its breath and 
how to get free to us. So, like one does with a horse. Like one does with a horse, absolutely. Mm -hmm. They learn. <laughs> and she, she has a horse that actually descends from one of the horses we have. Yes, yes, yeah. which is amazing. And the other is Icelandic. <laughs> oh, so one of the small ones. Yes, yes. yes. Um, I was I'm tempted to say shifting from the animate to the inanimate, but inanimate is not an accurate word. If you would choose a tree in your life, <laughs> a tree, a tree, some tree that you remember, whether at the ranch or in Texas at Spencerville whether on the islands, in Dublin, in Norway, is there a particular tree that you remember? I didn't. Pardon? I did it more than one. Well, I know, that's why I say choose one, because I'm the same. The first time I was asked this question, I started like the tree. Mm -hmm. And then actually, and I, I encourage you all to try this sometime, we were asked to write down all the trees we remember throughout our life. Just go through as, back, as far back as you can remember and just write down the trees. We have four or five hours before Mass to do this. I can't remember what age I stopped at, but I did not complete the list. And it was quite shocking to me that when you start to go back through the life, all the trees, the particular trees that I remember throughout my life. And so it's a hard question. At first it seems like a simple and facile question. But then you start to think about it, and you think, what tree do I choose? Well, I, I, I'm going to mention on, on probably tomorrow morning before I walk one of the trees, so I'll just leave it out until okay. then, because mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a subject of really, really of a poem. Okay. But, but the, the one I remember uh, very much from a child, and under which you and Bruce and Adrienne were photographed, mm -hmm. right? That maple, mm -hmm. wonderful. Uh, uh, maple, large, large uh, sugar maple growing on my parents' place. Um, and it was one of my favorite trees. And when it was smaller, I could easily leap up to the low branch and grab mm -hmm. it and climb up in it and uh, so on. But by the time they were photographed under it, it was a little too big for me. Mm -hmm. uh, or for I managed was... to get up it to read in it once. Did you? There oh, you I go. Did. There you go. <laughs> But it was a tree that was welcoming. You know, the branches mm -hmm. of a tree, just perfect, you know, and it was very welcoming. And you want, mm -hmm. it kind of drew you to itself almost by its magnetism. So that would be the one, I guess. A Lanark County tree. Uh huh. Yeah. Tree. Oh, that, uh, very, it's very simple for me. We had a shumac in our front garden, uh, and uh, we had a sort of a club in the shumac. Oh, yeah. So, uh, you know, other people on the kids in the street and we sat and chatted and was sitting up in the shoemack and so on. Of course the shoemack for me is also very symbolic of all sorts of things so I'm going to, I'm afraid I'm going to get profound again. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but the, 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 what I love about the shoemack is the fact that it reserves its greatest glory for the end. Mm -hmm. You know it's a fairly ordinary green tree but my gosh, when, it, when, when the leaves turn and it becomes yellow and crimson and those beautiful little red cord coins on the, uh, cones on it, 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 it's, it, it's absolutely it's beautiful. So it always makes me hope that uh, as you grow older, the colors get riper. <laughs> favorite body of water. Oh, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> a favorite body of water, and, or a body of water, because again, I, I'm horrible at choosing favorites myself, but tell us about a body of water that means something to you. Well, I would say, I mean, it's, it's a big body of water, it's not permitted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, well, then, uh, the Pacific Ocean off Vancouver Island. Mm -hmm. Well, I've been there. It's, uh, I've yeah. been Galliano with Lauren Wilkinson. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, um, do I have to answer this? <laughs> uh, uh, um, Probably, probably, probably Galway Bay, uh, um, uh, because again, it's associated for me with a twelve, a twelve going off on my own on a ferry and then getting into a curragh, mm -hmm. which uh, is a small canvas uh, black cup, uh, and all the men shouting as we, uh, as they, they brought us into the in, into the beach. Uh, I think probably if I had to, that that would be that would be it. Yes. You love sailing. 
speaking of water, you love sailing. Yeah, I took up sailing, and in, in, I, I was mentioning this, I think, to somebody earlier today. I, 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 I took up sailing when I was writing The Gossamer Wall, Poems of Witness to the Holocaust, because I spent almost four years, over four years, doing nothing but reading about the Holocaust mm -hmm. and writing about it. And uh, it was much to my, my, my late wife Breeds, my beloved Breeds, she couldn't, she couldn't swim. So she didn't want to go on boats, but, but she encouraged me when, because I had a friend who was sailing and she encouraged me to do because she was worried I was going to get depressed mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. thinking about nothing but this, uh, what was happening. Uh, uh, and so I took, up, I took up sailing in my 50s and, and um, I took lessons and I, I, I got my little certificate for, for being able to do it and so on. And then I got a boat uh, and uh, I went out every weekend uh, some, summer and winter and uh, in the winter you had to concentrate because as you know if you go in you don't last more than 10 minutes or a quarter of an hour even in Dublin Bay uh, um, and I would bring out friends who didn't know how to so I had the whole responsibility for other things so I had to I, 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 I enjoyed it but I was never a natural sailor because I was so late learning but I knew what to do uh, you know I'd learned all the points I knew what to do and I, I found it very very good and relaxing but as I also said to whoever I, I may have, if I'm repeating myself to somebody uh, it was very strange when my when my beloved Breeze went in had to go into care I stopped saying I couldn't say mm -hmm. I, I, I went out once with my friends on the boat and it just I couldn't anymore it was gone mm -hmm. and I've never said it since Oh, I, I know it was the, it was Father Robert was his name I think. Robert, yes. Father Robert, Father Robert, Robert, yeah. Afternoon. This, after, this afternoon, I, he's a sailor, and so that's right. that's how it turned up. I listened to him on this talk. Mm -hmm. Dad, what would be your equivalent? I'd be a canoe uh, on Lonely Lake Lonely or Lonely Lake, you know, on the by the ranch there. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my favorite occupations was, uh, you know, when especially in the fall of the year, early fall. Uh, go out uh, the wet, the early fall because uh, you out in the lake there's no mosquitoes and then by the shore there's millions, you know. Mm -hmm. So you, you go out in the lake and, uh, and, and lie on the bottom of the canoe and watch when the ospreys and the white and the bald eagles, you know, mm -hmm. watch their flight patterns. And I've had, I've had an osprey take a fish within six or seven feet of my canoe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And watch them all the way, you know, plummeting down and grabbing a black, uh, a, a black bass, or you know, smallmouth bass. And uh, my my very favorite thing ever happened in a boat. Um, I was watching a pair of loons, and I, and I thought, you know, what all know what loons are, you know, uh, a wonderful bird, um, and, and they 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 swim underwater. I don't know if you know that. So so we some animals dive and they. They'll make their way as best they can, you know. But the what, what what the loons do is they fly. They use their whole wings, uh, and uh, it's it's ethereal, you know. Uh, but anyway, I put my my canoe between two loons. They're always in pairs. They pair for life. They're they're really quite something. And uh, uh, at the end of the lake, and uh, it was actually in the morning in this particular thing, and uh, they, they didn't have their babies yet. Uh, and I thought, well, I'm just going to see what they do, you know. And what happened was that the female loon dived. The male was way over there. And well, where did she go? And I was looking on the canoe, and she flew right under uh, my canoe. You know, it, it was this amazing thing in another dimension, you know, uh, a, a bird flying. And then she popped up with him, you know, and they gave a kind of, hey, 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 you know, the how they do it. <laughs> So you are a dummy. <laughs> <laughs> is what that means in loon talk. <laughs> you both have given us some wonderful glimpses of your imagination. This next question might, well, it's not necessarily a more difficult question, but do you think you can sort of pinpoint when you first became aware of imagination as a aware of imagination as an imagine as imagination. It's kind of as a hard question, but we're when we first cognizant of imagination as existing rather than just not just, but rather than partaking in it. 
I can tell you when it was, mm -hmm. but, uh, but it wasn't complimentary. Mm -hmm. So um, I was an avid reader. Mm -hmm. I really got into books. As, there's another one right there. So you know that it's like you, know, you get completely absorbed and you're living in the story and so on. And some people, have, what are you doing? What are you reading? You know, and I would start to talk. And I, I, I was I had an imaginative role. But one of my grandparents said to my parents in my hearing, that boy has an overactive imagination. Watch it. <laughs> you know, and so it was, uh, you know, I mean, I, they, were, they were meaning well. They were saying that kids like likely to be telling the strict literal truth all the time. You know, that's what they, they, were, they thought they were saying. But uh, I, so that's my first notion of the, the imagination was a negative one. It, it meant I was taking liberties with reality. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was a bad thing to do, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I, I suppose, you know, took the uh, took C.S. Lewis, uh, and reading him as a university student, to cause me to rethink mm -hmm. that thing as an objective right. state of mind, right? I mean, I, I never kind of separated it from other acts of mind. But, uh, but Lewis made me realize that it was a necessary attribute of mind. Uh, and uh, especially necessary for those who wanted to have some uh, some experience uh, of the mystery of transcendence. Mm -hmm. right. mm. I haven't a clue. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't a, haven't a notion. I mean, what what comes back to me when you talk about that was the one the one that I loved to hear as a boy was. <laughs> I know what the hell it meant, but it was, it was something awful, terribly, highly strong. Uh, and, and I said to my parents, uh, uh, um, I mean, I was later to realize it was a, st a Stradivarius or something they meant. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, so it just reminded me when you say when you say, when, when you talk about that, I haven't a clue when I started to imagine anything. I really don't. I, I mean, I've been racking, while you were talking, I was racking. I can't think of anything, quite frankly. Well, I shift you to a different question then. Yeah. What's one or two of the first poems with which you fell in love? And I'm going to ask you about first poets with whom you fell in love, and they might not be the same thing. They may be the same, but we'll laugh or may not. I mean, the poems I would, I mean, as I. I remember, I remember the house I was where I was born, and so that was the one, obviously one of the first. And Donna Chabon, the other one I quoted, with a certain Walish and Chanik Mentin, and so on. The 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 uh, so they were sort of ones that cert certainly certainly got to me, um, but of a different sort. Uh, I mean, of, of a sort of more narrative style. I, I I remember. Does any man dream that a gale can fear of a thousand deeds? Let him hear but one. The Shannon swept onward, broad and clear between the leaguers of that loan and so on. So, I mean, though, though, I mean the, the magic to that is just, I mean, uh, it's extraordinary. It's actually, what it's about is, is a battle which, w when the Thirty Years' War, which was supposed to end in Westphalia, was being still fought out between the Jacobites in Ireland and, yeah. uh, 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 and saying, it was one of the battles which uh, was fought, the Battle of the Boyne being the, fam fa the famous one, which the Unionists still in Northern Ireland beat their drums about, you know, on, on the 12th of July. But this was they were being the, the uh, they were being driven across Ireland basically the Jacobites were losing and one of the battles was this uh, over the Shannon at Lone which is this, this poem is about on to Limerick where there was the Treaty of Limerick mm -hmm. uh, uh, which was broken as soon as it was made mm -hmm. and the leaders fled to fled to France and fought any war they could against the English uh, always shouting remember Limerick as their as their Queen their Limerick was their was their battle cry Wonderful. Do you know Hennessy's cognac? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. he was one of the the, 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 the they were known as the wild geese, and he, he, he was one of that. So that's that poem mm -hmm. uh, uh, that, that I remember. But but uh, uh, but uh, one scratch of fancy. I, I quoted this for you yesterday. Robbie Burns one. You know the Oh Mary at thy window be tis wished the trysted hour. Those smiles and glances let me see that make the miser's treasure poor. How gladly would I bide the stour, a weary slave frae sun to sun, could I the rich reward secure, the lovely Mary Morrison. <laughs> and, and on it goes. But, but, yeah. Yeah. So, though, I mean, things like that stuck with you. I mean, uh, Patrick Kavner, who is one of my absolute, I mean, I think he's at his best, I think he's the best Irish poet of the 20th century. Uh, um, 
but, but uh, uh, you know, he once said, if I have any roots, they're in the school books. And I say the same. Mm. I mean, it's, it's, <coughs> it's there you got the rhythms, it's there you got the magic, you know. And uh, I, I just, from, from an early age, feeling those things, thought that that's what I want to do. Mm. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and also, I'm sure others know this too, but I mean, I, I, if you're highly strong, you want to, you know, you, you, your emotions affect you very deeply and have to come bloody out some way or other, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, maybe if I, maybe if I had a musical background, where my, you know, where I had to think, maybe it would have come out in music. Mm-hmm. But I didn't have that, have that. But I did have words, and I came from a tradition of words. Uh, um, uh, and my my father had a ferocious vocabulary. Uh, um, uh, which range, which range from the nasty guru to having read everything, you know. So, so, so that words were the words what you had to find, but but to, to hear them in those rhythms and everything. I mean, I just, I still think it's magic. Mm-hmm. Every, 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 I regard it as a gift every day. I can sit down to try and recreate that magic. Mm. I have, I have something here much less profound than me. <coughs> Oh, you shallow people. (laughs) There's there's nothing to be done about it now. It's too late. (laughs) But, uh, you know, there there are two things that come to my mind. And one of them I mentioned in our conversation on on your uh, thing last year. I first understood the idea of a poem from my dad. Uh, He he was home on a shore leave when I was three. Uh, They were, you know, trying to fight off you boats going across the North Atlantic and stuff. But he, 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 you know, and he would come home and another baby would be on its way, that kind of thing. But I was the oldest baby and I was three years old and uh, he said, it's time for you to learn to pray. And so he taught me to pray before I went to sleep. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray thee, Lord, my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray thee, Lord, my soul to take. And, of course, it's very memorable. I prayed that every night. I, I think I probably stopped it after he came back from the war, but I did pray that every night as a little boy. Uh, and it was clear to me from a little conversation with one of my aunts, Mabel. Mm-hmm. Uh, she was very pleased I was praying this prayer. She said, you know, it's a poem. <laughs> oh, what's a poem? Well, a poem is something that has a certain form, and has a rhythm, and it has a rhyme, and so on. So that was the first, right? But my next experience of poems was in a, in, in a church context. And, uh, it has a touch with, a, a connection with his poem that he quoted. Um, you know, uh, it was right after the war, you have to remember this, and the war is very much in everybody's consciousness. There's no, there was no kid of my age who didn't know about rations and... You know, there was not enough food to go around, and you had to have rations to get what you could get, and so on. Um, <laughs> and um, at church, uh, we were, at that point, there was a very strong Celtic component in our church. And, uh, and, and uh, I suppose that's, I mean, that eventually went completely away, I think. But, uh, but our songs in Sunday school were poems that came clear as a bell to me. Know? And being a little boy uh, it, whose, whose dad and uncles were heroes because they had fought in the war, this kind of thing, uh, and, you know, I, I love the ones that sort of define my childhood, I think. Dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone, dare to have a purpose firm, and dare to make it known, you know. And I remember ex- trying to explain this. I was in a conversation as a, as a freshman in college. And, and my much more genteel American uh, schoolmates said, oh, that stuff's terrible, you know. I mean, it's, it's like armored Christian soldiers. It's triumphal, triumphalist. You, you shouldn't do that. And I said, you just don't understand where it comes from. I said, you have to imagine the sensibility that found joy in those songs. It was the same sensibility that understood perfectly well what it was to be back to the, uh, on a cliff, back to the sea, about 12 of you facing about 500 Sassanac in an ugly mood. And what happens? They say to the piper, war cry of Lochiel when he pipes it. And you go into it. <laughs> and that's poetry. <laughs> when, no, that, for me, that was a big part of what poetry was. It was enough to 
it was to rally you know you know what rally was a rallying cry and uh, so well, that would be where I would come from yeah okay, last question <laughs> Better Present, be good. Pres Gorge your loins. <laughs> 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 Present company accepted. Who is a poet for you today? Who is important for you in your life today? Who's somebody that you read right now or is shaping who you are right now? And again, I'm sure there are multiple. You can name one or two if you want, but. Yeah, well, fine. well, Michal and I have already uh, compared notes on this, and it happens to be that um, my three favorite poets that still move me, and I still reread all the time, happen to be among his. And so I'll tell you who they are, and, 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 and then I'll finish it with the, and answer proper to your question. So George Herbert, Gerard Manley Hopkins, mm -hmm. and Richard Wilbur. Uh, I've had the, the great pleasure of getting to know many poets and and in Richard Pick Pick Wilbur. Hold back, hold back. Pick Wilbur is one of them. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, but current influence, yeah. I mean, I I suppose what what Michal calls my nature poems. There's more of Richard Wilbur in them mm -hmm. than there is of, of Herbert or, or Hopkins. And it's a it's a matter of tone as much as anything else. Uh, uh, and uh, one of the things, if you, if you, I don't know how many of you have ever met uh, Richard Wilbur in person, but he's one of the most gentle and loving human beings. Uh, so you can't be with him for any length of time, even if you're just sitting in a reading and you realize this is a lovely man. You know, uh, it would be wonderful to spend time with him. Mm -hmm. And then if you have a few meals with him, as, as, as me, Helen, and I have had, you know, you, this is a lovely man. Uh, his poetry is a product of love, genuine love. And I just don't mean, you know, love poems that he wrote for his wife, Charlie, or anything like that. I mean love. I mean, there's just a love pours out of him. And his poem on any subject radiates love. And at, at 81 years of age, I'm, I am, how shall I put it, I am nourished by this. Yeah. Oh gosh. Uh, um. <laughs> you are next. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to be repeating a lot of that tomorrow night, but we'll probably that's another matter. But, uh, the 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 um, I mean, I had a friend, uh, I had a friend uh, uh, who drowned shortly after college. God rest his soul. But but uh, he used to always talk about his three B's in mu music, which were Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms. Uh, um, so I used to joke back and say I had three H's, uh, which were Herbert, uh, Herrick, and Hopkins. Uh, um, but I, I, I mean, I certainly would be a huge fan of Richard Wilbur's, uh, and I did also. We talk about that tomorrow, and I talk about my knowing him too. Uh, uh, I, uh, but Patrick Kavanagh, huge, huge thing. And he's not, he's not well enough known. He was, um, uh, he he was kind of overshadowed by other figures. But 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 he is certainly for me, the at his best. There is nobody like him uh, in in twentieth uh, century. Irish, literature in English in Ireland, uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, now he got got angry at certain points and went into satire and things. But though he has a wonderful line saying, "Satire is unfruitful prayer," he says at one, <laughs> at one point uh, 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 when he pulled himself out of that. Uh, uh, um, but but he, he, it's 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 it's, uh, it's it's lovely stuff, and those final sonnets of his are, are lovely. Uh, and and uh, certainly he had a huge influence. Now every, ev I, I never say this in Ireland because everybody in Ireland claims to have been influenced by Patrick Kavanagh, uh, um, but but I, I, I do hold him in, in very, very high regard. Uh, and uh, I, it was uh, my great friend David Ford, whom I, is the theologian I have mentioned maybe before, um, who's, um, I was talking to earlier today again, but, but uh, he 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 uh, he introduced me to Herbert, mm -hmm. uh, and I introduced him to Patrick Kavanagh. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of his first books, which he produced with his father-in-law, another very fine theologian, Daniel Hardy, yeah. uh, um, uh, who was uh, I was very fond of and was very 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 good to me always. Um, they wrote the first book they wrote. It was it was Laudate. It was called in in. Um, when it was published, I think in, in it was published in Britain first, and then it came out 
here Baker brought it out and called it oh there's some I'm flipping on the on the American title of it but but uh, that was based on Patrick Kavanagh's poetry and and uh, on, obviously on the scripture as well but the mixture of the two uh, uh, and uh, it it's, it's shows the richness I think of Kavanagh that particular book. Well, thank you both for allowing us in a little bit, see a little bit more of who you are than perhaps one would usually see if we went to take, you know, went to a lecture at an institution to hear you or perhaps even took a course from you. Um, so thank you for being brave enough to share a bit of that. And I know that that will shape and inform how we receive what we hear from you both over the next couple days. So thank you for the courage and grace um, for answering my many questions. Michal's going to close our evening with some poems. Um, quickly, before we close um, for the evening, um, a couple of reminders. You're welcome to arrive at any time from 8.30 on tomorrow morning. The coffee will be on and will be muffins available, so feel free to show up at that point in time. Our first session with Dad, Michal, and Anthony will be outside. So this is really important. Please, before we gather in the big room downstairs, and your schedule may say that we're gathering in the library. I've changed that. We're going to gather downstairs right below us here. So before we gather there at 9 a.m., please spray yourselves thoroughly for buds. You can leave your shoes on so you're ready to go. Uh, we want to be able to continue our session straight outside without pausing. So if you can come prepared. So if you need, if you need, some people won't need spray. If you need spray for bugs, you need a long shirt for bugs. If you could do all that, then wear your long or your walking shoes. Um, it is going to be cool, which is amazing. So wear long sleeves. Being cool also means there'll be probably less bugs, which is also wonderful. Um, and. If I may, just because the session is outside, it is no less important a session than inside. Perhaps it's even more important. So please extend your own hospitality to the speakers by trying to be here on time. Anthony, as you may have already discovered, <laughs> he's over there now. Um, Anthony is represents one of the three organizations that walk alongside and support us in these Little Athen ventures. Anthony is the new director of Arasha Canada, or uh, Arasha, I've said that so many times, of Arasha Ontario. Arasha Canada has been a part of Little Athen since the very beginning, since our very first year. And that relationship's an integral part of who we are and what we do. And so it's a privilege to have Anthony here as he steps into his new role and drawing us into that. Please go talk to him and find out more about Arasha. And if you haven't already, you also meet John Franklin. Where's John? Oh, he's at the back there, yeah. <laughs> Director of Amago, the arts and faith charity under whose umbrella Lamathan is able to receive donations. Amago does fascinating work. So do please seek out both of these gents to learn more about the work they do. And we're also grateful to Regent College for their encourage, encouragement and facilitation of our work here and their annual assistance with and making available recordings of our gatherings. Um, so with that, we will put ourselves in your hands and your words. May I use the lecture? You may indeed. Yeah, thank you. So it's, e it's easier standing up. Mm -hmm. So I'm, this will probably be about 20 minutes or something like that. I hope that's acceptable. I was asked to read a few poems. It's hard to define a few poems, so I said I'd read for about 20 minutes. I'm going to read them for five, maybe six. So um, I'm going to start with uh, the epigraph to um, my collected poems, which harks back a little bit to last night, but I also want to read poems of a different, very different nature to last night. So the epigraph is Hail Madame Jazz. 
Worship. Hold her a moment in thought. Femme fatale, she shapes another fate. Unveils an idol, oh, never to be caught. O oh, minx, beyond this mind's embrace, hide her, go seek her, miss unfathomable, demurring lady playing at the chase. As stars are atoms we turn, fall towards each other's gravity, I spin in your love's nexus, mistress all. Once a child of Newton's fallen apple, I'd the measure of your ways. My stars, my atoms, are we one? Mischievous strategy, Madame Jazz. Old tunes die in metamorphosis. Rise, fall, reawakening, I praise. So I'm going to extend slightly from, from that uh, into a poem about jazz, which has hints of what I'm saying in the first one, but I, which I think you'll pick up. Cosmos. All right, booms the saxophone man. Everybody feeling chameleon? The combo expands the tune of a well-battered song as opulence of sound clash and flow as a spotlight tunnels dust in its beam. Glints the trumpet's bell, and the hall turns hot and hybrid. Beery listeners swaying and bobbing the mood of a theme. From rainbows of timbre, a strand of colour floats into the air. The trumpet solo burping one phrase of a melody, ripe and brassy and buttoned down as though a song is breathing over its origins. These four hot-blooded notes weeping their pleasure again in an old Civil War bugle, a sleazy backroom in New Orleans. Sax and rhythm, the brightness of a reed, winding tune and croup are working on another hue of the tune that moves into its own discourse. Bud Freeman, Johnny Hodges, Charlie Parker, all right, he draws, then scats a little as we clap, a tradition of subversions. But he's off again. I watch swarms of dust in the spotlight, swirls of galaxies, and imagine he's blowing a huge balloon of space that's opening our world of order. In a waft of creation, his being becomes a music's happening. A red-shirted pianist now leans to seize a gene of the song which seems to veer and improvise, somehow catching a moment's shifts and humours. Hail, Madame Jazz. Let the theme return, its mutants echoing as a tune bounces against its freedom. One key, so open-toned and open-stitched, a beat poised across grained rhythm interplays imprecations of voice over voice, mutinies of living are rocking the steady state of a theme. These riffs and overlappings, a love of deviance, are genesis in noise. I, I, jazz fascinates me for, for many reasons, and one of them is, of course, it comes out of a history of terrible suffering. Uh, uh, incredible suffering and it also because it has the exuberance of a, a fight against suffering which you get in you get in Irish Cayley music in fact there's a sort of a, a tremendous exuberance which comes out of famine in some ways uh, or if, if you think of Eastern Europe the klezmer music of the, of the ghetto has that same strange mixture of, 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 of there's a sadness but there's an exuberance at the same time uh, so for all these reasons, but, but of all the reasons, improvisation, the fact that an old tune can be taken and improvised on. And one of the, one of the great thoughts in my friend David's new commentary on John is improvisation, the whole time that, that, that John is inviting you to improvise on the text, the whole time. So now I'm going to read a love poem. It's called Matins for You. There's a line in Irish, in, in Irish in it, but fear not, because it's translated in the next line. <laughs> Matins for you. 
Come again, glistening from your morning shower. Half coquettishly, you'll throw your robe at me, calling out, hello, hello. I turn over, stretching out to snatch a bundle from the air, and once more to watch that parade across your bower. Jaunty, brisk, allegro, preparing improvisations of yet another day, as on our first morning 27 years ago. Sit on the bed end and pull a stocking on, slip that frock over your head, let it slither a little, ride your hips, then spread its folds and tumbles, flopping past those thighs to swish against your ankle. I'm still all eyes. The thrill and first frisson at the half-known but unsaid, at hints and contours embodied in a dance of dress, I'm oogling snugly from this your still warm bed. Now you're hurrying, business-like and ready to go. I wonder if I've ever glimpsed you, or of all those years I even as much as knew, behind those hints and suggestions I admire, what inmost aim or dream or heart's desire calls out, hello, hello. Flirt and peekaboo of such unwitting closeness, or take for grantedness complex web of intimacies where we slowly grew. Sometimes wells of aloneness seem almost to imbue your silence with the long, wistful rubato of a Chopin nocturne, or is it a Shannos tremolo? Ma vien tu lum be lum gach aurlach go da chri. If your mind be mine, each inch of your heart for me. That infinite longing in you, a girl racing to follow the bus lamps to meet your father at Bunbeg. He steps down from the platform. Hello, hello. You smile your father's inward zen like smile. And yet its light shines outward, as when I watched you helping a child to word the coy, swaggering pleasure of new shoes. Amuse, the more amuse, in being amused. That inward, outward smile, delights in delight conferred, fine-tuning those strains and riffs of wishes unspoken, desires another's heart doesn't yet know it has heard. Now I see you, now I don't. The doubt and loneliness of what's always new. Moments seized in double time, loves impromptu, you, as when late last night you started telling me how even as a girl you would known your dream would be, bringing others' dreams about. This once, I think I glimpsed you, you, my glistening, lonely Mistress Zen, thank you, thank you for so many dreams come true. I mentioned that one of the most important things in my life has been friendship. Uh, um, so a sonnet which is uh, called For My Friends Spendthrift friendships once raveled and unraveled, carefree, leisurely as a journey without a plan. Easy come, easy go, there was a while I travelled lightly, made my friends catch as catch can. Gradually the casual twisted the precious weave, this tissue of feeling in which I have grown. Though I follow a single thread, I must believe that bound to the whole, we never drift alone. Crossed, matted fibres, long inwrought, friendships prove the fabric of a common story, the web which takes the strain of every thought, shares the fray or stain, joys in our glory. Interwoven, at last I dare to move without misgiving. 
I touch the invisible, love this gauze of living. I'm going to, so the, I was once, um, I was once on, a, uh, when on a tour, I was uh, at the airport in Pennsylvania, uh, uh, in, uh, in, um, in Philadelphia. And it was, I remember it so well because I was very frustrated. We were waiting and waiting and the plane didn't take off and everybody was getting tired and everybody was getting cranky. And there was a, there was a, a lady there who had a child with her and the child was starting to scream and so on. And suddenly she uttered just one word to the child and the child settled down. And I looked and I thought, I, I didn't recognise what language it was. I was very curious. And I began to think of the words you know, that people have, you know, hush a bye. And the kids, a kid said, it sounds show in show is what you say in Irish. If, you, uh, if, you're, uh, if you're in Tokyo, you say nen nen yo, nen nen yo. Uh, 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 and, and on it goes, you know, be be blocker, be be blocker is what you say in Icelandic. Uh, uh, and uh, so on, 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 it, on it goes, you know, the, the, the um, aya papaya, aya papaya is what you say if you're German. And the kid settles down. So I decided. I was going to write a lullaby. So a poem called Lullaby. Lullaby. Stains are in, stains are in, the instant our songs begin. To rock a my darling baby, dreaming up worlds of maybe. Then bissa bissa barna, Betty buys my snowy arna. Quieter now and slumber bound, Rest in lulls of milky sound. Ninna nana, ninna nana, la mia babina italiana. Aya papaya, aya papaya, do so my nakleina freya. Hush a bye and nen nen yo, the moon is high in Tokyo. Be be blocker, viking anna, showing show, show an anna. All is well, I wouldn't lie. Trust again this by and by. Valleys deep and dark unruly. David Bach, see hey luli. Puss, puss, calake, my talent child, night won't stay. Sandman fallen, lullaby sung. Sleep, my love, in a mother tongue. <laughs> Two more, and then I'll let you. Let the lullaby take effect. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, the, these are ones which uh, in, will be in future books. Uh, um, and the first one is, just, is a celebration of, I live on, uh, for those of you who know, know New York, I live on East 79th and East End, uh, you know, because the grid in, Man in Manhattan. So this is called East 79th. Uh, and we look out onto the East River. The, you, you know Manhattan has huts on one side, the East River on the other side, and all the avenues run lengthways and all the streets run crossways, which has relevance because it's going to be east-west for the streets uh, and obviously north-south then for the, for the avenues. So this is a poem called East 79th. East 79th runs from the river west at dawn, our bedroom's low half fellow guest. I beg your pardon. East 79 runs from the river west. At dawn, our bedroom's low hail fellow guest. A lemon slice of sun announces day, but soon slips south and out of view to play a game of hide and seek on all our streets. Behind skyscrapers, shadows, it retreats. Our casts its shafts of light down avenues. A harbinger of heaven, dropping clues of how at dusk E seventy ninth will forge a canyon of late light, a still lit gorge, a lesson on perspective down a street where high rise parallels will almost meet, to frame a promising beyond the dark, a slice of orange glows over Central Park. So thankful I have loved and been loved twice. I'm walking westward towards paradise. Mm -hmm. And finally, I want to read a love poem. Uh, 
which you may, as it's not coming out of the collected, you may guess it's more recent. Now, those moments when your whispers tell me how you know you never loved like this before. I want to echo you and say the same, but knowing I once loved as I love now, my telling you I love you even more would now disclaim a love I can't disclaim. Before I have the time to hesitate, preempting me, you tell me how you know I'll say that yes, I've loved like this before. My life's a check I wouldn't now predate, but dating it today, what do I owe? This love of ours is neither more nor less. Yet I have never loved as I love now, nor have I ever loved like this before, for I had never lost a lifelong spouse, or ever made a second spousal vow. I've passed through second paradise's door, and know the loss and gain one heart can house. Another me, I play another part, as on my mended wings I dare to soar, and fold it in my fathom's lullaby, the nook between my shoulder and my heart. Tell how you never loved like this before, and I who lost and gained, say nor have I. Thank you. Thank you, Michal. Thank you. Commitment. Three.